so glad to have everybody here now. I just did want to say before we even started that this is absolutely fantastic. I've been missing these meetings. It's one thing to try and do it on Zoom and everybody looks kind of disjointed like on the Brady Bunch, but it's really nice to see you guys in person and have a good turnout here. And I'm glad we're doing a little hybrid meeting here. And we're very fortunate because we have Steve Noakes with us. Steve will be sharing his experiences as a longtime steward of the Forks of the Credit. Uh, he's championing uh, our causes uh, with the West Credit uh, Association there. And um, Steve earned a degree in environmental science. He's a lifelong fly fisher, fish keeper, and breeder, and has been a professional aquaculturist for over 20 years. He will share with us his work at the Greg Clark chapter of Trout Unlimited Canada, and he will also explain his videographic skills using drone and underwater equipment. So, hi everyone, I'm Steve Noakes. Thanks for coming. And uh, I'm going to be uh, showing some videos tonight and talking about the West Credit <laughs> and uh, Brook Trout and, and uh, photography and videography and the West Credit Coalition and the Greg Clark chapter and our current work projects um, that we have going that are uh, Brook Trip related. Um, if you'd like to volunteer for one of the work days, um, because of COVID, we've, we haven't had a lot um, in the past two years, but uh, next year we're hoping that uh, we get going uh, full steam again and, and have uh, work days uh, once or twice a month with the, with the Greg Clark chapter and uh, working on uh, brook trout um, habitat restoration in, uh, in two different locations, one at Highway 24 and one uh, on the West Branch on a pr private property on the West Branch. So it would be great to see uh, anyone who wants to come out and volunteer and, and plant trees or work on habitat structures, structures with us. It'd be, uh, it'd be great to see them. So can we uh, start with the... A video, David. Okay, so this is the West Branch. Um, the West West Carter River runs from uh, um, well Wellington County west to Caledon, and um, it, it goes through uh, the town of Hillsburg, through uh, um, Aaron, and uh, finally ends up in Caledon and uh, empties into the main, main branch of the Credit River at. Uh, Forks of the Credit Road. Um, that was a great blue heron, one of the um, main predators of, of brook trout. Um, as I mentioned, it's one of the prime uh, um, predators of brook trout, um, mink as well. But but as I said, the, the main predator is uh, are other brook trout. And uh, these are some uh, young um, brook trout sitting on a groundwater upwelling. Um, you can tell that they're uh, smaller fish, immature, not necessarily immature fish, but younger fish because uh, they have par markings on the, you can see the dark vertical barring on the side of them. That that signifies that they're, they're a young fish. And uh, this was taken with uh, uh, 15 times macro. So the, uh, they're, they're, they're quite a bit uh, smaller than they look on the screen. So this is uh, some more drone footage. Um, closer to where um, the, the confluence is with the, the main credit. So it, it shows a diversity of, of habitat. Um, this is uh, another uh, group on a, a groundwater upwelling, using it to, to stay cool during the summer months. Um, again, shot with a 15 times macro, so um, the fish are a little bit smaller. Um, this is a uh, a, a, terrestri a terrestrial spring. So one of the reasons why the brook trout do so well in, on, uh, in the West, West Credit is that uh, uh, all the spring water keeps them cool. It's, it's, it's also essential for their, uh, for spawning and uh, egg, egg in in incubation and uh, embryo survival. Um, it, it keeps the eggs at a, a, um, a constant temperature during the winter. Um, here's another drone shot of uh, some of the headwaters and another shot of uh, underwater shot of some of the fish. And you could see um, the sand is also a, a indicator of groundwater. 
um, as is the, um, the um, watercress in the background. So um, these fish again are, are sitting on a, on a groundwater upwelling. Um, and yeah, um, the, the, the fish are, are surviving quite well on the, on the credit. Um, there are, they're facing numerous problems, but um, climate change being one of them, but uh, it, it is probably the, one of the most intact populations in Southern Ontario that we have, that we currently have. And uh, this is another drone shot um, downstream, uh, pretty close to where the confluence is with the, with the, uh, the main branch of the Credit River. Um, this is another drone shot of some of the spawning habitat. And you can see all of the large woody debris in the water that, that um, makes for such excellent um, habitat for brook trout. It creates scouring and uh, habitat for them. Um, and and the riparian growth is 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 key to that. Um, here's uh, another small group. Um, they often use uh, the darker rocks like that on on the lighter bottom in order to, for for camouflage because they're they're worried about uh, predation from above. And uh, you can see the one fish there is quite dark, so he was probably. Uh, spending a lot of time in the rocks like uh, you, you can tell the different um, where the fish have been uh, holding by the, the coloration that they currently have when they're on a very light bottom like that you can see uh, that, that the coloration is, is quite light um, here we have another drone shot and this is uh, above Shaw's Creek Road um, not far from where the uh, the, the proposed uh, outlet for the sewage treatment plant is going to go, um, which I'll be talking about in, in a few minutes. Um, here you can see why there's so much wood and the, the cedar the cedar only has a limited uh, moisture tolerance. So if, if the channel changes, um, the water levels change dramatically, it tends to kill the cedars, which in turn end up in the water and add to the habitat. We're heading into fall here now. And uh, this is some of the drone footage from the fall from the upper section uh, just below Aaron. Um, you can see some of the fall colors coming in. Um, this is actually right where the, the discharge pipe is planned for the, for the uh, sewage treatment plant. And uh, here we have some uh, brook trout spawning. This is a pair. Um, brook trout um, start to spawn when the water temperatures uh, are uh, drop below 50 degrees or uh, uh, th what uh, 13 degrees C. And uh, this is a pair of spawning right here. Um, you can see the female digging a red and uh, over overpositing. Um, they use uh, what, what were called intertestidial inter zones which are basically gaps in between the rocks where the upwelling will come through and uh, it keeps the eggs at a, a constant temperature um, through the winter. And um, another interesting um, fact about Berkshire spawning and, and their, their requirements for, for uh, incubation is, is silt content. So um, there's, there's a balance. A lot of people think that, that silt is, is, any silt is bad, but silt is a nutrient. So it's, it's key for benthic benthic life and benthic health but um, in terms of brook trout spawning um, they need a little bit of silt because they, um, the, the, the embryos suffer from what's called entrapment if uh, if there's not enough if there's not enough silt it acts like a like a, a lubricant for the gravel so that in the, in the, when they're coming when they're going to emerge they can pop through the gravel if uh, there's no silt at all, it, it, um, they, they get what's called entrapment, which is basically the gravel um, compresses and becomes too solid for the embryos to, to swim up through um, in, in the spring when they, when they emerge. Isaac Walton and, and Trout Unlimited, the Greg Clark chapter and, and several other uh, organizations are part of what's called the West Credit Coalition. 
So uh, we have monthly meetings and we're working hard to um, protect the, not only the brook trade, but the, but the cold water habitat that's there. And um, please support us. I uh, believe, Dean, what is the website? It, CWRs.ca. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit briefly about uh, some photography that I do. And um, I'm not a professional photographer, but, uh, you know, I've, I've come up with techniques that work for me. So I'll just quickly go through some of the things that I, I use. Um, I, I love bridge cameras. So bridge cameras are, are super zoom cameras, basically. So it's, a, it's like a, a hybrid between a, a point and shoot camera and a DSLR. And uh, the, the, they're fairly reasonably priced from about oh, six, five, six, seven hundred dollars up to two thousand dollars for the Sony's. Um, at that point, you're almost better off to get a DSLR or a, a better camera. But again, um, they're they're light, they're compact, and they have a extraordinary zoom range. Um, the Canon in the picture there is. Uh, is a 65 times zoom with a, a, a 1400 uh, uh, millimeter equivalent uh, zoom lens. So it's, it's, a, it's basically a telescope. <laughs> um, it's very light. Um, it, it's not a lot of money and uh, I don't have to worry if I, if I fall in the river with it. It's just, there's a monopod there. I, I spent quite a bit of money on a, on a good monopod because uh, the, I found that that's what I use the most. Um, there's a, a, a fluid head, which is just a video head. Um, but th that's excellent for getting really stable shots. And this this uh, tripod has a, like a, or monopod has legs, so it's ideal for that. Uh, make sure you have a polarizer lens, um, a, a circular polarizer. Um, that's probably all that you need. And, uh, and that's about it. This is uh, 60 Mile Creek, um, some steelhead spawning, um, taken with the bridge camera. So I was quite a distance back. And you could see that uh, you can get some excellent close-up video of spawning fish or whatever you want. Um, and then you can blend it with uh, underwater footage that you'll see up here. There's a pair of spawning. Um, again, 60 mile creek steelhead, um, a wild population steelhead. And these are the fry um, in the headwaters that uh, emerged around June or so. And uh, you can see lots of little steelhead fry. I do uh, a lot of bird photography too. So on the bridge camera note, like it's excellent for that. Again, the, the still quality image is not that great, but as you can see, the the uh, the, the video quality is excellent on it, uh, 4K video, and uh, you can't beat that that uh, zoom. You can really uh, get right in on the birds. Everybody's favorite cedar waxwing and uh, Kentucky Kentucky warbler, uh, uh, red listed warbler species in, in uh, Ontario, uh, Eastern Bluebird, one of Don Arthur's favorite birds, <laughs> and uh, Baltimore Oriole. So uh, a lot of us have uh, other interests other than fly fishing, so you can, uh, if you're packing one of these cameras, you can just uh, satisfy many hobbies at the, at the same time. Um, okay, so here's the my GoPro kind of setup here. Um, I use a wide variety of uh, techniques for underwater filming. Um, I like to keep it simple if I possibly can, but I've also came up with a, a, a camera raft that has a um, onboard uh, Wi-Fi hub and uh, it allows me to take uh, video above water and below. It has uh, like a, a crane style mount adjustable mount um, with uh, mounts on the raft for above and below um, the water and um, it's it's I there's a I use a, a flexi leash basically so it's a, a, a retractable leash to uh, scroll 
or move the raft up and down. It's very smooth movement, so it just goes back and forth very easily. Um, and it has a, the, the real benefit of being able to see what you're filming. So you can use the, the, the GoPro app and the, the live preview. But it, it was not easy to come up with because uh, uh, Wi-Fi does not work underwater. So you tend to lose the signal once uh, you submerge the camera about an inch or so under the water. So uh, I, I was just asked if uh, there was any surprises from, from running the camera raft. And there's always surprises from running the camera raft. I've, I've seen uh, largemouth bass and brook trip water and all, all kinds of things. So it, it's, it's evolved to the point where I could throw my car keys into the water and, and find them with the raft. So it's, it's pretty, it's a pretty fascinating thing. But the only problem with the camera raft is that um, a lot of rivers are uh, in valleys. So you have no Wi-Fi signal or, or you have half a bar. So um, it's not always the best technique to use. I'd, I'd much rather use something simple. Um, here I was just using a mini tripod and the water was so shallow this year that uh, that's really all I used this year was I, I know from experience where the fish are going to be sitting so uh, I can just set up my mini tripod and uh, it, it's it's not long before they come back and if, if, you, if you know like uh, where they're going to be. The other thing with GoPro cameras that I highly recommend is a, a macro lens so uh, GoPro cameras can't focus on objects that are very close. So um, there's lots of adapter kits, uh, lens adapter kits and, and snap-on lenses that you can use. Um, even for the, the, the latest GoPros all have, you know, uh, uh, with, with um, aftermarket um, lens adapters and things like that, you can, you can uh, use a macro lens and that will enable you to, to uh, get good shots up close. And so I've been experimenting with uh, getting frame stills. So uh, stills from video basically. Um, and with the new GoPro is, is in 5K. So it averages out about a 10, 10 megapixel frame still. So um, it's, it's, it's not, it's not a, you know, perfect, but it's getting better all the time. So, um, and that, that's ideal because then you can wait for the fish to get exactly where you want to and him look, the, all of them looking at you at the same time and then pull that, that exact frame and use that. And you can put it in a, I would probably recommend putting it into a, a, a photo editor and, and cleaning it up a little bit too. That, that, that always helps as well. Okay, so moving along, um, I also do a lot of drone work. Um, I'm not a you know professional drone guy, um, but uh, you know uh, and anyone can fly them. I highly recommend it if you uh, if you have an interest in it and you and you want to give it a shot. Um, but but the prices are continually coming down on them, and uh, you know for for filming, um, I do a lot of filming over rivers and stuff like that. So. Just make sure that you have, uh, you know, you have some experience before you start flying out over water for especially lakes and rivers, because you don't want to send that drone. You don't want to send your $2,000 drone down into the, because, uh, you know, it, it can happen very easily. So, you, you know, get, get a little bit of flying experience first, and then uh, you can, you can go for it. Um, the other thing I'll mention about drones is that, uh, for you know for any photography um the golden hour is is gold for photographers so for the uh for for the uh you know the the, the first couple hours of light and the last couple of hours of light are always the most photogenic if you
the work that we're doing with the, the uh, Greg Clark chapter. I'm uh, one of the board of directors. And uh, we have John, our secretary, is here tonight. And um, this is a Highway 24 project that we've been working on. This is an example of the uh, more intact habitat that's a short distance downstream. Um, this is what it should look like with uh, you know, proper uh, riparian that's close to the water, that's adding wood to the water. Um, this is an example of, um, this is uh, close to the highway. So this is an example of more degraded habitat that has, uh, that's all um, been planted probably in the last 20 or 30 years and was basically a field before that. And uh, there's very limited riparian growth upstream. So there's not a lot of, there's almost no wood coming downstream, um, just the odd log. And so uh, there's no real scouring and uh, uh, no, it, it inhibits pool formation and, and uh, overhead cover for fish. So um, with, with uh, no habitat like that the, the, and heavy fishing pressure from being uh, close to the road, um, it, it's, uh, it's not a good life for these fish uh, in, in the last uh, maybe 15 or 20 years. Um, before that, it was uh, heavily enforced with the, by uh, local conservation officers, and uh, there was a lot of habitat in there from um, previous restoration efforts. But uh, since since then, it's it's uh, it's been washed away, and it, the upkeep has has been uh, non-existent. So um, the the chapter. Um, uh, has to, the last couple of years actually had been working on a, a plan and it was a it was a long drawn out process to get the um, permissions and from all the different landowners to 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 start doing this and you can see uh, some of the progress that we've made so far where it's a cedar sweeper that we dropped in and there's some of the uh, bankside habitat that we've we've uh, we've installed so um yeah so we we uh there, there was already uh, um, logs, submerged logs in there from previous restorations and, and some natural. So uh, what we did was augment the existing wood that was already there. So we basically built a frame-like structure on top of the logs that were already there with, with larger logs. And then we overlaid that with, with finer brush and, and, and smaller branches to uh, um, and basically it was a, a, a lattice type uh, structure that we were trying to do because as, as uh, the limited uh, wood that's traveling downstream, um, it, a lot of it travels along the edges and um, there's a, the, the, the holes in the structure are meant so that on a, during high water, the branches and the wood traveling downstream will flip up over and into the, the holes in the structure. and and fill it in over time. Some of it will wash away, um, depending on how high the, uh, um, how uh, you know intense uh, the the flooding episodes are. But in turn, uh, wood traveling down to downstream will also get get trapped in there again. So it, it's kind of a um, a, ki a continual process. The structures and the wood is not put on the flush with the stream bed, so that um, if anything, it will erode underneath. The structure so that um, it gets deeper underneath the structure and, and we're careful not to put them uh, too close to the to the stream bed for, for that reason that we don't want them becoming a bank instead of a habitat but uh, the location that i'd showed there was uh, also a, a, a very deep undercut there was about a foot and a half undercut and and uh, um, They've last year, or the year before, they got a six, 16 and a half inch brook tree from, from right from that pool. And uh, historically, there was, uh, you know, they would average in the, in the 90s, uh, electro fishing, they would average oh, uh, two to, to three, even 350 fish just in that pool. So um, now uh, during a typical red survey, they get, uh, I think the last one was 60, 60 fish or something like that. 
so the, the population has, has dramatically dropped. And it's it's not just the, the human pressures there; it's also uh, um, climate change and things like that. But if we don't uh, if we don't make the habitat like as good as we can, then then uh, you know they're not going to survive for very long. Um, okay, so I'll just keep moving. Um, these are some of the signs that the tra chapter worked on. So we we uh, we were complaining for for many years that the uh, that the the fishing regulation signs were not adequate and uh, were not clear. Um, brook trout are especially susceptible to uh, being caught and released when uh, the water temperature is over 19 degrees. Um, so we just came up with something basic uh, rather than get, I know people don't like to carry a thermometer and they don't often use them. So our idea was just to, to set a, a temperature of 28 degrees. If, if the forecast calls for 28 degrees or higher, then uh, we're asking people not to fish for brook trout. Um, it's, it is primarily a brook trout thing. Um, brown trout uh, you know, are, are more uh, temperature tolerant although even uh, 28 degrees is, is pushing it probably for brown trout in a lot of watersheds as well. But uh, so that was that was what we came up with. And okay, so this is uh, on the West Branch. We have another project started uh, for next year. Um, the proposal is just about to go in. It's another habitat restoration. You can see the, the wide open fields here with uh, very little tree cover. Um, there's a small tributary there with with uh, very little uh, shade and, and and tree cover there, and uh, the, there's some woody habitat in the water, but it, it's it's mostly in unusable in in silt and and uh, in very shallow areas. Um, we may be putting in silt traps. Um, this is an example of of what the habitat should look like with uh, you know um, proper. Uh, uh, bankside cover, uh, large wooded debris, um, shade, that kind of thing. Um, we're, we're not really sure whether the property was uh, uh, cleared for a, as part of a pine, pine plantation or whether it was flooded at some time. There's indications that it was a hardwood forest in the 50s. So, uh, but but we can't really find any records of, of, of how it got into that, that state, but uh, uh, it's also not far from downtown Aaron, so there's a lot of silt and a lot of, uh, uh, you know, some some influence coming from from downtown Aaron. So we're trying to mitigate that, as well as uh, it's just upstream from uh, the sewage treatment plant site. So uh, it's also a really good spot to uh, to focus some of our efforts. Okay, so this was uh, Brookshire Fry survey that I did for the West Credit Coalition um, at the outflow site where they're planning on putting the discharge pipe for the for the uh, sewage treatment plant um, was done this spring. Um, these are some of the fry that were present. Um, like I said, it was it was not easy to do because I missed the, the when uh, when they were really abundant. And this shows all the locations where I found them um, earlier in the spring. Um, it's, there was some quite large groups. Um, our, our main idea, like I, I, I was asked to do it because they consider the, the tunnel, the, the, um, the culvert um, as degraded habitat. And uh, we wanted to show that uh, Brookshire are not only using this, but the Brookshire fi Fry are using it as an avenue to, to travel up and downstream, as well as there's nurse nursery habitat for the Fry upstream and downstream. Um, so that was the idea with that. And uh, luckily found a few of them that were still around that were uh, right in front of the, the culvert, as you'll see here in a minute. A couple good shots of them right in front of the culvert. Um, yeah, so that was uh, sent to the whoever would listen. And uh, some of the black nose days, um, 
showing a healthy aquatic environment. This is when the, the juvenile black nose emerge in the spring. Just uh, one of the primary bait, bait fish species. The, the West Credit is a cold water fish community, so the, the uh, species diversity is fairly low. So this is uh, where the fry were found on the other side of the culvert. Um, that was a shot of the culvert and fry right there. And uh, as anyone knows, like we took offense to the fact that they were calling the habitat. They were, they were, they were saying that uh, because there's no macrophyte algae growth in the in the culvert because it's in full darkness all the time that it was considered degraded habitat but as anyone that knows knows or fishes for brook trout um, we all know that culverts are the number one uh, location for brook trout i mean if if you're going to find brook trout anywhere on a small brook trout stream it's going to be in the culvert so where they came up with that idea I, I couldn't tell you. <clears throat> I think that's it. Another quick shot of the fray. And the culvert. <laughs> that was not an easy shot to get. <laughs> So this is uh, the, what's called the Solmar property. So the people that are um, building the sewage treatment plant, they're also uh, building uh, the, the housing developments that are, that are going in here, what east of, of uh, the town of Aaron. And um, so they, ha they have a property there and uh, it, it had a large uh, forested area and there was a cold water tributary that, that feeds um, the, the West Credit there, and uh, it has a couple couple branches to it. What happened was uh, they decided to to clear cut a, a large section of it out, and it was about uh, a forty meter um, patch of of uh, forest that they had to cut through to get to the other side of this tribu tributary, and then they um, proceeded to drive heavy machinery. Um, back and forth through it. Um, and um, they also clear cut a very large um, section of, of, of the forest that was a, a riparian buffer zone that, uh, that feeds into the, uh, into the West Branch. So um, I was asked to uh, find Brookshire Fry in it. Um, and I did find uh, Fry uh, quite quickly in the lower section in the springtime and as well as I found adults um, upstream uh, right in front of where this this video is was taken and you can just roll it now David thanks and so this shows uh, where they where they uh, clear cut the, the forest and uh, where they're doing a lot all the crossing and uh, so unpermitted and um, so the, the DFO the DFO was called and the CVC was called and anyone else who would listen was called. Um, this is uh, some of the brook trout spawning downstream <clears throat> and some of the fry. And um, so we're still awaiting to hear uh, what's gonna happen, whether they're gonna be charged or we're assuming that they are gonna be charged with something. Um, whether that will discourage them from putting the plant there, I, uh, we, we don't believe that will happen, but um, it, it may slow things down for them. Um, we're not happy that the, the sewage treatment plant is going in there, and we're concerned about the, uh, the effluent temperature and a variety of other things. Um, th there has been some debate over whether uh, leaking septic systems have contributed to the uh, water quality uh, degradation of uh, the West Credit. 
in recent years, but um, I don't think there's any conclusive studies on that so far. This is a bobolink that's uh, one of the uh, species at risk found in the area. Um, Savannah sparrow and uh, eastern meadowlark would be other bird species that are found there in the area. Um, so this is just more of the crossing here showing uh, the damage. So this is immediately downstream what it you know where it flows into the to uh, into the West Credit River there and uh, Yeah, well, it, it was a lot. It, the The concern is that the sediment on a unforested bank, like during heavy rain, it will, all of that uh, uh, soil will end up in the tributary, as well as uh, the thermal impacts of it. So this is this is the same tributary where uh, it's not uh, hasn't been uh, degraded or clear cut. But yeah, that was the concern that. Uh, um, not only is it uh, uh, preventing the thermal cooling to the to the, uh, the the West Branch itself, but there's also silt, and as you can see, there was also uh, mounds of, of uh, dirt and that were dragged across in large tracks that would have prevented uh, fry migrating up and down. Uh, the DFO did find uh, uh, the adult Berkshire that I found. In, in the tributary uh, uh, the, the, the week the week uh, after that um, I did the survey they found the, the same fish in the same location and uh, they seemed pretty convinced that uh, it was a important cold water tributary we've uh, we've managed to recruit a wonderful artist. And she's taken some of your video footing, footage, and I want to just show you this uh, video. It's, it's just three minutes long. So the artist is called Brenda Maris. Uh, this is your shot. So she took a still of that and she worked on it. She's in Papamore, New Zealand. <laughs> Would you like to just come over this way a bit, Steve? So what she's doing here is she's isolating the actual fish and she's outlining it taking away a lot of the background material. So you can just see the fish. She's doing a color study, getting the colors right. So then, then she put this onto canvas and she started painting. And here she's adding the little markings on the, on the back. I should mention that uh, John was involved in this all the way through. final painting that she made. John, would you like to say a few words? Uh, 
I've only known Steve for about, uh, about five years now. So if you need a, a question answered about the Credit River Watershed, Upper Credit River Watershed, he's the guy to go to. And he's the guy I do go to to answer all my questions. Uh, just over a year ago, he introduced me to the West Credit. I was dinking around down at uh, the Grange and fooling around trying to get browns. And I said, uh, Steve says, come on up here where the, you know, the brookies are. And I had a fabulous day. Uh, but uh, Steve, we, uh, I'll read it here to Steve. Thank you very much. It's from Brenda Maris, New Zealand, David, and myself, and, and all the brookies in the head of the credit. So we thank you very, very much for all your efforts, cons conservation. So.